Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I want to talk a bit more about the Cerberus new 8-bit computer that I built in the previous video. In today's episode, I want to give you a brief overview about how the system actually works and how it is laid out. And in the second half of the video, I am going to take a look at some software that exists for the system so far. And I hope I can uh, motivate some people to make even more software. Just in case you didn't watch the previous video where I actually built this from a kit, this is Cerberus 2080, a newly designed 8-bit system that is meant to be mostly an educational platform for learning about how computers in general work, especially focused obviously on the uh, old-school 8-bit architecture. This is pretty closely modeled after what the early 8-bit systems did uh, from a design point of view, but uses some modern quirks, obviously, and it's made up from parts that are readily available today. Basically, what I'm going to do in the first part is to go through the excellent technical overview that is in the manual that comes with the kit or the pre-built device. You can buy these as kits or as a pre-made device from the Home Computer Museum, which is the Dutch Home Computer Museum. And actually everything that isn't production costs and cost of components goes directly straight to the funds of the Home Computer Museum. And I think they can use it at the moment, especially since they didn't have a lot of uh, public in there for a long time due to the current situation in the world that you probably heard enough of uh, and I'm not going to get deeper into that. I am going to get deeper into the system though. And I'm not going to claim I'm an expert on computer design or anything like that. I have some experience with working on uh, old school retro 8-bit systems and I know some of the internal workings of those but I'm not going to claim I'm an expert. So I'm basically just referring to the technical overview in the manual that is freely available as a PDF as well. I'm going to link to that in the video description in case you want to read up rather than hear me talking about this thing. Yeah, let's have a look. Before we start, let me take a second to thank the sponsor for this video, which is PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs. And obviously with an open source project like this, you can also have the PCBs for this made with PCBWay. They offer excellent service and very quick turnaround times and delivery and the prices are really reasonable. So I highly recommend checking out the link in the video description. Let's get back to the Cerberus. And because this is mostly an educational project, it's pretty clearly laid out and it is divided in two major parts, which is the graphics circuitry. This has a VGA circuit in here that has its own crystal, which is a 25.175 megahertz oscillator that uh, is solely for the video output. And then we have the half of the board that is the actual computer with the processors and that has a 16 megahertz oscillator. The two parts of the system are completely asynchronous and they communicate via these two dual ported memory chips. There's a two kilobyte video as RAM and we have a two kilobyte character as RAM. These are basically gluing these two parts together and the VGA circuit basically only reads the uh, video RAM and outputs that. There's two custom ICs in the VGA circuit, which is Skunk, which is short for scan counter and clock that controls all the VGA timings. It's a CPLD, that means that it's reprogrammable and highly customizable. And then we have Kavia, which is the character video adapter that scans the video and character memories, these two RAMs, and generates the screen itself. Now in this lower half, which is the computer portion, we have CAT, which is actually an 80 mega 328p 
It's a custom 80 mega, that's why it's called CAT. <laughs> that is the I.O. system and the system master. Of course, this is a standard microcontroller chip and you can reprogram this uh, pretty easily using the Arduino IDE even. That's pretty amazing and people, as we're going to see later, people have done quite some nice things already with this uh, chip to customize it. We also have the Spacer chip, which is another uh, larger CPLD. That's the Serial to Parallel controller that manages all control signals, the clocks, and translates the serial data from CAD into parallel words and vice versa. So uh, this, these two communicate. And of course we have two processors. That's the Z80 processor and that's of course for running actual code and applications. And the other processor that also can run code and applications is the 6502, in this case it's the W65CO2S, which is basically the same as the old school 6502 with more advanced manufacturing techniques. So this is uh, able to run at higher clock speeds than the original MOS 6502. The Z80 is also uh, a model that runs on higher clock speeds than the original line of Z80s, but as far as I know, these Z80 chips are all completely compatible, whereas the 6502, the new versions of that, are not uh, plug and play for most old school systems. The Z80 pretty much remains unchanged and is a plug and, a plug and play replacement for the old school Z80 or Z80, depending on where you are coming from. <laughs> and for a proper 8-bit computer, we also, of course, need some RAM. In this case, there's two 32 kilobyte SRAM chips. I kind of like the fact that uh, the decision was made to limit this to 64 kilobytes of RAM in total, uh, which is divided in low MAM and high MAM, both 32 kilobytes. If you're familiar with regular old school or newer school computers, you might have realized that this doesn't have a separate ROM. That's because uh, the ROM portion that is, of course, also hidden in here because you need some kind of basic input-output system or BIOS for a system to be able to start up and uh, do the kind of chores you need to get everything uh, into its initial state, like a reset state. And that is actually inside our AT Mega, inside our CAT chip. There's 32 kilobytes of internal flash memory in these. And that is used for the BIOS. Actually, in older systems, often the BIOS would be on an EEPROM or on a ROM chip and then uh, copied into the RAM. So you couldn't use the whole RAM. Part of it was used by the core system or the kernel, as it's called on some of the 8 bits. And uh, this has the uh, ability to run completely separate from the RAM. It runs directly from the flash memory in the CAD, which is kind of neat, so you have more memory to use for applications and things like that with the 64K of SRAM. And of course, in the manual, there's these nice charts of how things are interconnected. Pretty simple. The processors can talk to the RAM, and we have a general address and data bus that are basically going through the whole system uh, so one of the processors talks to the bus, uh, all the other chips have the signal on one of their pins and can work with that. Uh, we have the oscillators here, this is our video circuit. As you can see, it's pretty, pretty much separated from the rest of the system. It talks to the data bus, of course, but it's connected through these uh, character and video SRAM chips. And then we have the video circuit that actually generates the output, as I said, the Skunk and KVR chips. And yeah, the SRAM, the system SRAM actually talks to the data and address bus, which interconnect all the other chips. 
And yeah, here's our 16 megahertz clock for the computer portion and our oscillator for the 25.175 megahertz for the VGA circuit that only talks, that only clocks the VGA circuit. The CAT chip is configured to use the 16 megahertz oscillator instead of its internal clock in this setup. <clears throat> and it's basically, as I said, the system master, the BIOS code is on there. And the BIOS code actually is compiled on the Arduino IDE. We are going to take a look at that later, as I said. CAT performs all input-output functions, the file system operations, the keyboard control, and the sound output, which is generated or which is made audible by this little buzzer. The CAT chip also has direct memory access through the spacer chip over here. So that's uh, interconnected and spacers connected to the RAM actually. And while CAT is a serial controller through spacer, the signals can be accessed uh, from the data bus and the address bus. And CAT also is responsible for providing access to the CPUs uh, from the user. So all user input basically goes through CAT, that's the master. And that's also the reason why this whole thing is called the Cerberus, because it basically has three heads, like Cerberus, the uh, mythical three-headed dog. Uh, CAT is one of the heads, the 6502 is one, and the Z80 is the other one. And CAT basically glues the whole thing, the whole computer part of this together. It also provides the uh, system clock frequency for the CPUs, so um, you can run this at 4 or 8 megahertz, which are of course divisions of the 16 megahertz crystal, because it's just easier to divide the 16 megahertz into stable 4 megahertz and 8 megahertz clocks that are then provided through CAT to, to the uh, processor that, that's active. Let's talk about the spacer chip, which is a CPLD. Is uh, basically, it's a glue chip that puts all the parts of the computer portion together. And the design of the spacer is the core of Cerberus's architecture. This also enables the multiprocessor approach. So this is the chip that actually talks to the processors and uh, makes the signals work with the rest of the system. This basically replaces a standard control bus with a fully connected control network that orchestrates the activity of the three processors and four memories. So this is the heart of the Cerberus. All the control inputs and outputs of all ICs are processed by Spacer's internal logic. It does the memory selection, so it enables the appropriate memory IC depending on the contents of the address bus. It controls the read and write output, enables signals for the four memory ICs, uh, four memory ICs being the SRAM here and the graphics and uh, character RAM. It also generates the signals for the CPUs to reset, start, halt, try state and uh, interrupts. That's based on the output it gets from the CAT chip down here. And it's also, as I said previously, translating the serial data and addresses into parallel signals and vice versa. So uh, things can talk with CAT and CAT can talk to the rest of the system. The VGA circuit in this computer generates a standard VGA signal, so it's 640 by 480 pixels uh, with a clock of 25.175 megahertz. Each Cerberus pixel is 2x2 two two, though, so it matches uh, the older 8-bit systems better with a resolution of effectively 320 by 240 pixels or 40 by 30 characters of 8 by 8 pixels each, which is kind of a standard size for old school 8-bit systems. So it's very close in that regard to original old 8-bit uh, computers of the late 70s, early 80s era. Each of the 40 by 30 addresses in video memory holds a byte that identifies a particular character from the character set. And KVR, which is this smaller CPLD, 
reads out that byte, which then becomes the eight most significant bits of an 11-bit character memory address. And it reads out the corresponding eight bytes of the character bitmap in character memory, which is this chip here, by progressively incrementing the three least significant bits of the addresses from zero to seven. We have our whole screen here with our lines, 30 lines and 40 columns and there's addresses for each 8 by 8 pixel or double pixel, <laughs> quadruple pixel, really 2 by 2. Uh, yeah, that's the character positions and this is a character bitmap. And as you can see, we have bytes, which are 8 bits in each row. And this is a character, uh, one of these blocks here. And that's how the screen is organized in memory and actually translated directly from memory to the screen. The Caviar chip basically scans all addresses of video memory continuously and also the corresponding addresses in character memory. So each 40 character line in video memory is scanned 16 times per frame, 8 bytes per character times 2 passes per byte. Skunk basically counts all the relevant intervals. As I said, there's 480 pixel lines that Skunk has to handle. And then there is a blanking interval, vertical blanking interval. And we also have 640 pixels horizontally. And there's a horizontal blanking interval after that. And Skunk handles those synchronization pulses and generates the clock for Kavya from the pixel clock uh, using an internal divider. There's also an 8-bit shift register in here. Uh, each byte from character memory is temporarily stored in here when it's read out and it shifts each bit of that byte out to the RGB line of the VGA connector according to a shift regist register clock that's also in here. Yeah, and that's basically all you need to make up a little 8-bit system, which this is. The rest is in the programming, in the software, actually. As I said, in CAD, there is a very uh, basic input-output system, BIOS, and that allows us to access the SD card, which is the external storage in this system, which is of course, it's important to have something you can run software off of or to save software too. And if you want to know more about the system, there's actually a whole series of videos about the design process of this whole thing where some of the decisions that Bernardo, who designed this, made are discussed in great detail. And I highly recommend watching that if you are interested in designing something like this, which isn't, it isn't rocket science, but it's quite <laughs> the involved process, obviously. And Bernardo did an amazing job, especially in terms of this being uh, pretty clearly laid out and highly customizable. Uh, most of these chips that uh, glue the system together are completely reprogrammable if you are capable of doing that. And as this is basically a hobbyist project, although Bernardo is a proper computer design engineer, uh, so he actually knows what he's doing, most of the fate of this system depends on you, the programmer. And hopefully somebody uh, is going to make more software for this. As I said repeatedly, I'm not capable of doing that because I don't know much programming except for some Commodore 64 basic but that's not going to be of much help with programming this. We're going to look at some of the software that is already available and made uh, freely available to everyone who wants to tinker with it by some amazing people who already provided some interesting stuff for this thing that makes it a lot more useful. So let's have a look. In the last video, we briefly took a look at the uh, basic very basic uh, example programs that came with this preloaded on the uh, SD card. And that's uh, stuff like this, a little uh, cell demo program. 
that is the 6502 version. There's also Z80 versions of these demo programs. But obviously, this has been released in 2021. The initial version of this was uh, released in 2020 even. And in the meantime, some people have developed software for this that is a bit more involved. Most of the stuff I'm going to show you uh, is open source or at least freely available. So uh, you can have a look at the code if you know your code, <laughs> uh, unlike me. Uh, unfortunately, for most of the more involved stuff, we have to modify the programming of the BIOS a tiny little bit in order to be able to run the software actually. So we are going to have to reprogram our microcontroller chip in circuit, which is uh, possible with uh, this FTDI header that is directly connected to the CAT chip and we can use this USB adapter, it's an FTDI adapter, to connect it to our computer, a modern computer, and use the Arduino IDE basically to reprogram this. These things are super easy to obtain and not very expensive. They are like kind of literally a dollar a piece or something like that. Uh, obviously we have to put this, there's a little jumper, usually on these. We have to have this in the TTL logic position, which is five volts logic because the whole Cerberus architecture works on TTL, old school TTL five volt logic. You obviously want an FTDI adapter that lines up with the correct pinout, but these are standardized. I think uh, the pinout should be the same for each adapter anyway. I have now hooked up my elderly laptop here to the USB port of our little uh, programming adapter and we should now be able to update the BIOS on the Atmel chip, the 32 kilobytes of flash memory that's actually integrated in the chip through the Arduino IDE, which I have also uh, already started up here. I'm going to show this process with the standard BIOS and uh, basically literally test this because I've never tried this as of yet. So let's see if we get somewhere. Obviously the process is the same for flashing different BIOSes to this. Uh, I'm just trying this with the standard BIOS to see what this does. We have to select the board Arduino Uno, which uses the same chip, I think. Our COM port, that is the COM port the USB is acting as, uh, which is easy in this case because there's only one COM port active. And we want to change the programmer to AVR ISP. And then we want to load the Arduino sketch we want to flash. That's available on the server's GitHub, obviously. It should be in the cat directory, I guess. BIOS. Arduino sketch. Okay, let's load the BIOS. That's the Arduino sketch for the BIOS. And as you can see, we have the code that's super well structured and commented. So it's relatively easy to modify for people who know how to program Arduinos. Upload using programmer. Compiling. PS2 keyboard is not there. Okay. Yeah, we have to upload the keyboard thing first. <laughs> PS2 keyboard. Manage libraries. It's all laid out in the manual, actually. You have to do this step first, I guess. This takes a while. So it seems like the first thing we have to do is to upload the PS2 library, which is called PS2 keyboard. By Christian Weichel, Paul Stoffregen and others that should pop up there. So our PS2 keyboard library, we should install that previously because that is used obviously for the PS2 keyboard input. <laughs> that is just included. Include means it's basically uh, the code for this plug-in kind of thing is loaded 
and compiled with the rest of the sketch and then uploaded. So we can't really compile this without this library being installed. And now we should be able to uh, program this, upload using programmer, hopefully. Yeah, now it loaded the PS2 library and it's uploading. And our little, you can't see it at the moment, but our little FTDI adapter is happily blinking away. And Cerberus is restarting, as you could hear by the little jingle there. And it seems like things went right and we still have our BIOS. Yeah. However, we are now going to flash another uh, BIOS onto this, one of the modified ones. Unfortunately, there's not a standard one yet, not a new version of the BIOS that works with all the software, so we are going to flash the one we need for each uh, piece of software. That's the only way at this point. But in the future, hopefully, there's going to be kind of a consensus kind of thing for a new version of the BIOS, and that will include the necessary options that these modified BIOSes use for the software. The BIOS I'm uploading is actually made by Andy Toon, and it's uh, an update on the original BIOS, basically. So I have the Arduino sketch loaded here, and we should be able to hopefully upload it using the programmer. Yeah. That's not working. Well, that took a bit more effort than I thought. Uh, I have no idea why, but my Windows installation of the Arduino IDE was not able to program the uh, XFE BIOS by Andy Toon for whatever reason. Um, it's, it's a quite uh, involved process. You have to install another version of the PS2 library than is offered in the uh, Arduino IDE itself. So you have to compile that from the GitHub page of the developer of that library. You also have to add the Timer1 library that is also called in the code and is not mentioned anywhere in the uh, documentation. But I got there in the end and now I have the 0xfe BIOS running here. And this version of the BIOS is actually not particularly useful. I just wanted to see if I could install it. There is a version of Manic Miner, the classic Manic Miner, a part of that, that Andy made, uh, who also made this BIOS version or variant. And it's not publicly available as far as I can see, but uh, Bernardo got a preview version of it, kind of, and made a video about that. It looks pretty good already. So uh, what we really want is another version of this BIOS that is actually built upon this BIOS. Basically everything I'm going to show in this video is linked on uh, Bernardo's The Byte Ethics uh, Cerberus main page, kind of. There is an online development toolkit that Andy, who made this BIOS that we just installed, also made, including a Cerberus emulator which you can actually use in your browser. <laughs> and yeah, there's also uh, links to documentation for the instruction set for the 65C02 processor and the assembler syntax is also linked in here. So if you are more of the programmer kind than I am, you could use this to uh, quickly prototype stuff and uh, yeah. This is pretty neat to have if you are developing or if you're planning on developing for this system, obviously. And as you can see, our cell demo runs without any issues. That's the one we saw on the real hardware. So uh, Gordon Henderson made a slightly improved version of Andy Toon's uh, 0xfe BIOS that I'm going to try to compile and upload in a second to run some amazing stuff. So this actually should enable us to run some software. Sorry if this is confusing and uh, a bit uh, divided into different forks of things at this point. It's still in its very early stages. The whole project 
wasn't available for quite a while due to the chip shortages. But I hope to see some like consensus on a future BIOS version that uh, should be compatible with everything in the end. So let's see if we can upload this and if it actually compiles and works. Fingers crossed. It's compiling and it's uploading. This takes a while, obviously, because it's... Oh, okay, that didn't work. Why doesn't this work? The GH BIOS doesn't work, which is a bummer. I don't know if that's due to some of my libraries not being quite correct or something. And this is actually what happens. Uh, something's going wrong with the BIOS or with one of the CPLDs. That's kind of the uh, tilt state of the system. Going to reconnect my programmer. Let's try that again. I guess this doesn't work for some reason. Maybe there have been some changes. I know that there have been changes in the CPLDs. At some point, maybe this isn't compatible with those. I'm not sure why this wouldn't work. So I can't show you some of the things I wanted to show you. Hmm. Uh, namely, Gordon Henderson ported RubyOS, which is uh, an Acorn standard for some of the early BBC machines, I think, and you all supported BBC Basic version 4 to the 6502 CPU. Unfortunately, I can't show you because uh, the BIOS version doesn't seem to want to work. I tried that several times from different <laughs> platforms now even, and it just doesn't work for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, there's, however, another version of BBC Basic for the Z80 CPU, and that's made by Dean Belfield, who's uh, better known to some people in the community as Break Into Program. I'm also following uh, Dean on Twitter, and uh, there's some interesting stuff, so I highly recommend checking that out. There's also a link to the web page and some information on how BBC Basic was ported. So I'm going to download the whole repository here just to make sure I have everything. And we should be able to program that BIOS. He uses another uh, slightly modified version of the BIOS. So let's see if we can run this at least. Let's see if we get that to work. We can at least show BBC Basic on the Z80. Hey, and that worked. And it switched to Z80, also magically. <laughs> In order to run this basics, the BIOS had to be modified slightly. As I said, uh, the major modification that Dean made was to allow uh, the processors, or the Z80 in this case, to talk directly to the I.O. controller. So uh, the processor can actually issue load and save commands. So this can basically talk to the SD card and load and save software from there through the I.O. controller, which is uh, the chip that holds the BIOS in this case. So the BIOS can be modified to allow for that, which is pretty neat. And Dean did that. That's a very minor modification in this case. I think that's the only thing he needed to change for making this work. And well, yeah, we're going to try to start this on the actual Cerberus. So I went on and downloaded some of the repository. And we should be able to start BBC Basic, I guess, and run it. And we should have BBC Basic, <laughs> a Z80 port. And there we are. <laughs> BBC Basic Z80, copyright RT Russell. And RT Russell, of course, is the original uh, programmer of this. And obviously I can now uh, program this in Basic. Oh, and my keyboard is, of course, a German keyboard. So where is... Oh. That's going to be fun. There we are. It's the A umlaut. <laughs> we should be able to run this program now that I just uh, wrote. Mistake! Oh, it might be case sensitive, actually. Yes, it is. <laughs> and now we should be able to run this. Yay, and it's pretty fast. Okay, 
Yeah, that's BBC Basic for you. Nice. This is pretty neat. So we have a basic uh, interpreter running on this Cerberus now, which is considered one of the best basic interpreters of all times, or at least one of the best classic basic inter interpreters uh, back in the day. Uh, we can load some example software that is on here. It should work, hopefully. Yeah, that looks good. There's a cube. That's a 3D rotating cube. Exciting! And of course this is pretty blocky. There are some extra uh, graphics libraries that uh, somebody made, I don't remember his name at this point, but this is what you get in the standard configuration of this BBC Basic. It isn't capable of doing much graphics stuff. Yeah, but this is pretty impressive. This is just basic code. And it's not even a lot of basic code. We have some kind of sound thing, I think. <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, the sound commands uh, basically, uh, it works the same. And just in case you didn't recognize the tune, it's Amazing Grace, obviously. That is BBC Basic. That's pretty neat, actually. So you can program stuff on this if you know some Basic. Yeah, let me show you something else. Uh, BBC Basic, there's so many possibilities, obviously, because it's a whole programming language that can be used uh, to make your own stuff, to load different things. There's another thing I want to show you that should run on this BIOS. There's the version of Sokoban. Yeah, there we are, Sokoban. So let's try and play some Sokoban. We just switched this system on the fly to the other processor and this is now running in 6502 assembly, I guess. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of lovely. And I already messed it up. Oh no! I think you, you probably get the idea. This is Sokoban. Classic puzzle game and I completely stuck... Uh, yeah, this didn't work. Q. Really quit? No. Restart level. Yes. There we go. If you are not familiar with the game, the aim is to put these uh, box kind of things into these uh, fields here. That finishes the level, in theory. Yeah, not the best Sokoban player in the world. Just wanted to briefly show this to you. Another relatively recent development from Alexandre Dumont. I suppose that's supposed to be pronounced in French. Sorry if I'm butchering your name here. Uh, fourth the programming language, that which is a very classical programming language. Stack-oriented, procedural stack-oriented programming language. I have no idea how that works, so I'm not even going to try to show it to you. But uh, Alexandre also made another emulator, which uh, can do both CPUs and... Yeah, that's a Windows program. I'm running on a Mac here, so I can't really show that to you at this point. But that's another Cerberus emulator that's more powerful than the other one I've shown you. So there is stuff happening for this system. A lot of things are happening. I hope there's going to be more developments for this. It is a pretty exciting platform. And as simple as it is, I think there can be quite some involved stuff ported to this. Especially since this thing has kind of the best of both worlds of classic uh, or retro 8-bit computing, the uh, 6502N, the Z80. So many, many applications that were written for real old 8-bit systems should be pretty easily portable to this system because it uses the same assembly languages. Always keep in mind that this is kind of a charity project for the Home Computer Museum as is also 
engraved on the circuit board. Uh, I highly recommend checking out Bernardo's page. Bernardo's videos about making this system are super informative. If you are interested in more details about how this thing actually came together and how uh, decisions were made and how the inner workings of this uh, work, I'm not the best person to tell you about these things, obviously. Bernardo, who designed the system, is, obviously. Yeah, I think that's it for today. There's not much more I can say about this thing with my knowledge of the system and the software I could find online. Uh, I'm going to link everything you need in the video description. If you're interested in building one of these, I recommend watching my build video maybe that I did previously. Thank you very much for your support on Patreon or on the channel memberships page or on Ko-fi or on PayPal or your comments and your subscriptions and everything else that makes the YouTuber happy. <laughs> I hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. I'm a terrible soccer band player. <laughs>